What does an ambassador do? Ambassador does a lot of things. Officially, an American ambassador is the personal representative of the president. In the country where he's accredited, where he works, he outranks all other Americans except the president, interestingly enough including the Secretary of State, the man who sends him his instructions. Although very few ambassadors are inclined to fight with the Secretary of State over protocol positions. But it is true. The second thing he does is that he comes to a foreign government and explains the views and the interests of the United States. But even more importantly, perhaps he listens to the foreign government and it conveys their views and their interests back to his own government. He's not the only one who does that. Uh, there is uh, an ambassador of the country where he resides in Washington who also does the same sort of thing. He makes speeches to the foreign public to tell them about U.S. policy and interests. He attends events. He goes to conferences. Uh, he sponsors events. Sometimes he has aid programs that help a foreign government. He participates in the exchange of individuals through scholarship programs and things of that sort. So there are a wide number of things that an ambassador does. Incredible. It it's is. A, it's, a, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah very much yeah. so. You cover the world in a country. Which gender, in your view, holds greater hope for the world? Men oh, I or I'm women? a great believer in women. I think that women are more sensible. <laughs> they are, in many ways. I think that um, there's obviously competition between people of different sexes, but among people of different sexes. I think women somehow have found a way to become more cooperative. Uh, maybe it's because that's where our society across a wide range of cultures puts them. Uh, and that may be a learned uh, activity or attitude on the part of women. But I think women are also capable of bringing uh, a different set of what I would call assessments. I think that women are not in any way ego-less, but I've seen ego get in the way of more people's good relations with others than perhaps any other factor, and it's an important one to take a look at. And I think that you can't operate without an ego, but you cannot let your ego operate in place of your good sense. And so I think women bring that. They bring a different attitude toward things. And I think that that's, that that's very helpful. I mean, I would put women in charge of peace anytime. Men have difficulty in dealing with it. Um, and I think women do too. <clears throat> Anybody who negotiates for the United States finds that perhaps 60% of the negotiating problems are with Washington and 40% with the other side. <laughs> that may be an admission that somehow or other diplomats are always more sympathetic with the other side. But I think that even if you work hard to try to take a look at what's a fair deal that you're working on, uh, you're influenced very heavily by American domestic political attitudes. And American domestic political attitudes, particularly in this day and age, have taken on a much more polarized uh, approach to things. I always say one of America's big problems is Saturday afternoon football. <laughs> you got to have a winner and you got to have a loser. Uh, and to some extent in our domestic politics, we look for winners and losers. And losers don't win at the polls. And mm -hmm. so there is that very heavy influence uh, on people who make decisions who come out of our political sphere. And it's probably fine. It's a counterbalance on diplomats maybe wanting too much to have an agreement, which may be a problem of a diplomat or any negotiator. Uh, once you get wound up in a very difficult problem and you begin to see ways through it, you become attached to finding an answer to that particular problem. It's normal. And Americans are problem solvers. And so they may have this perhaps more uh, deeply ingrained than other diplomats do. And it's a very interesting approach to how and what way you, there are things out there you have to guard against as you're working for your government and trying to figure out what its interests are. With ego removed, ideally. With ego, put it this way, within bounds. Within bounds. Yeah. Well said. Controlled. Controlled. What are, you, what are your thoughts on the legalization of marijuana? Well, it's an interesting question. I, I'm not a pot smoker. <laughs> I, I've always thought uh, that for a number of people, it was akin to beer. 
uh, and therefore probably not worth a huge amount of effort to try to suppress it, including large, putting large numbers of people in jail. There's an alternative view that I don't think can be entirely dismissed. Does it with people with some weaknesses uh, begin to form a habit forming uh, 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 addiction. Addiction of some kind, sure. or uh, near addiction in some kind, and does it then adjust and affect people's personality and their capacity to do work and their capacity to have judgment? We all don't know. I mean, alcoholism is a huge curse in our society, even though it's legal. Yes. Um, I think that hard drugs are particularly clearly habit-forming and vicious in their impact, and in many ways, as a result, destructive of human life. And one doesn't want to go around advocating um, uh, the ingestion <laughs> of all kinds of things that end up making life tragic, not only for the individual, but for the people who are close to them in one way or another. And everybody's close to somebody in their lives you know, in the most difficult circumstances. On the other hand, you don't want to go around persecuting people for things that most of society can tolerate and live with, can control and can handle. And I think marijuana is, is, is in, the per, in the period now where we're seeing uh, an effort to be a great deal more tolerant of it, uh, in part because it is better to focus our attention on things that are more destructive. But I think the, the growing legalization of marijuana is probably something that's inevitable as our society changes in that direction. How do you think the color of Obama's skin has affected U.S.-Russia relations? Um, or do you think it has? Of course it has. It's in a sense that um, both countries have had a history of some racism, maybe more in the United States than in Russia, and it's harder for us to get over it. Um, and I think that to some extent um, that has to have played a role in people's attitudes and opinions. I think it's terribly unfortunate. But at the same time, it's extremely significant that this country, by a large majority, has elected someone not of the old dominant white aristocracy or mm -hmm. race uh, to lead the country. Um, and that he's had ups and downs and difficulties and problems. Nobody expected it would be easy. And I suspect some of that has been complicated, unfortunately, because Racism hasn't disappeared from the face of the earth, unfortunately. Slowly but surely. Oh yeah, I think so. But a long time, but I, I don't, I'm not comfortable right. with a long time, but I think one has to be honest about this. But I think everybody has to do their part to the extent that they possibly can. What was it about Alice that made you go gaga? Oh, I don't know. There was a lot of things, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're, I mean, you're physically attracted to someone, but then I think as you get to know them, there is kind of the sentimental attraction, the emotion. And then after that, just good sense. Yeah. How would you define intimacy? Well, I think it's being able to know and understand and like a person through thick and thin and have whatever gets between you disappear uh, because you make it happen. No grudges no long-lasting differences. So do you have any secrets to the art of staying together? Well, I think, yeah, talk, obviously. Yeah. Never let anything come up that sits between you uh, that uh, lasts more than a day, <laughs> at the most. Yeah. At the most, yeah. that's, great. Yeah. that's great advice. Yeah. No, we did that, and that made a big difference. Do you have any unfulfilled dreams? Oh, always. I think everybody has ambitions. I've been very lucky that most of my ambitions have been overfulfilled. <laughs> and I think the, the ones that, oh, I always thought I'd like to, oh, I always thought that politics would be fun. The more I've seen of it, the less I'm attracted by it, <laughs> particularly in this day and age. But I thought that was one thing that was interesting. But I've been very lucky. I've retired four times, uh, twice from the State Department. Um, uh, at, at the point of my uh, second retirement, I went to work for Boeing, the very large American aerospace company. One of the things that was important to me in helping Boeing, I ran essentially their overseas representative offices at the corporate level, uh, was to make sure I stayed up with whatever was going on around the world because they depended on me and my staff, in fact, to keep them informed and to represent them in places overseas. 
So I affiliated with a large number of boards and advisory groups in Washington that were following or tracking situations that we should be interested in, that anybody should be interested in, in my line of work. So I've kept those up. So I'm at the moment, I think, uh, conservatively a member of 40 or 50 boards and advisory groups, almost all of them in the not-for-profit sector, but they're helpful. And I undertake a series of projects because I'm interested in it. So I can't say that my interests in any way are stifled by lack of contact or by a lack of opportunity to understand or be in touch with people that are going on. And Washington is uh, the kind of place where every day you'll get invited to conferences, presentations, discussions, and speeches. And you know I could do that uh, without stopping and, and never sleep or eat. Uh, most of those I turn down just because I have other things that are on my agenda that I'm doing that I consider of higher priority. I suppose the big stumbling block in all of this is that how do you shed things? <laughs> and then how do you keep a balance in what next you take on? And I always find um, that perhaps through a colossal lack of judgment, I take on more things than I'm able to get rid of.